Good evening. It is 5 p.m. on Sunday, Mar- May, May, May 31st, 2020, and this is Bible Study Pal, the Sunday evening edition. I am Greg Circle, the preacher for the Church of Christ that meets in Palmyra, Indiana. We're certainly glad that you're here with us uh, this evening, uh, joining with us and watching uh, this live stream of our uh, evening sermon slash Bible study. I hope everybody had a good Lord's Day uh, this morning, or today, all day long. Uh, so we're certainly glad to have you here with us. Um, we are going to talk about a day, This, like I said this morning to the you know, to the church in my morning sermon, and I hope you watch that uh, live stream of our worship service. Like I said to them this morning, we're going to go back and I'm going to revisit a sermon from uh, 2016, I think it was. Uh, but I wanted to bring it out again because it it's kind of... I'm focusing today on the fact that this is Pentecost. Um, this is the day that... Um, many, many Christians are celebrating as Pentecost, and I don't know if people fully understand what it is. Uh, Christians will will point out that Pentecost is the day that, uh, in A.D. 30 or A.D. 33, whatever, the day in which God poured out His Holy Spirit on the apostles. God, the Holy Spirit, came down uh, onto the apostles and began inspiring them uh, to... Uh, to give the message, I'm going to move the camera just a little bit here. All right, to give the message that he uh, he was wanting them to give. He he started the church on that day, but it's kind of interesting because we have to keep in mind the the Jewish background of the church. the The apostles were Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. Um, at least, it, you know, in, in a certain sense, in, in the sense of their heritage. And this day of Pentecost is not just a Christian holiday. And I know that's, that may be kind of weird to say, but it's important for us to remember what this day meant to the original audience. Um, and there's a few things here, and we talked about this morning the, the apocalyptic language that Peter uses in his sermon in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, that first day of Pentecost after the resurrection of our Lord. And, you know, that kind of has a meaning that I don't think we fully get sometimes. I, I, we, we, we've lost something, and I'm going to bring that out as we go through the lesson. But the holiday, as they call it, is Shavuot, or... Somebody correct my Hebrew pronunciation, please. Um, but this is a, a festival, a feast, uh, that is... It's translated a couple different ways in, in the Old Testament. Uh, it is the, the Feast of Weeks. You know, it is seven weeks or so after the Passover. Uh, so they call it the Feast of Weeks. Uh, it's, also, it's a harvest feast, uh, well, maybe not a harvest feast, but it's like it's the feast of the first fruits, they call it. So the first time that wheat uh, is coming in, I guess a spring wheat is, is coming in to the grain bins. Um, they're celebrating this, but there's more to it. There's one other point that, I mean, there's one other reason why this is here, and it's shown in this picture, um, in this picture that I was selected from a few years ago. This is the day, this is Mount Sinai. This is the day that God presented the law through Moses, through his prophet Moses. Let's read, uh, if you would please, grab Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 3, and let's read uh, these few verses. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel. And then we'll talk about what exactly Moses was to tell them. Well, we might not talk about it exactly what Moses was going to tell them, but 
but we'll talk a little bit about um you know how it i think applies how how it moved forward how god used this time in their history and he he drew a parallel to it in the new testament with jesus with the apostles and maybe you might even say with peter in particular but that's another sermon all right let's get into our lesson so we talked a little bit about what it is um, let's talk about it a little bit more it is in fact a jewish holiday it was this past weekend it ended uh i guess saturday night um you know just like many of of their other holidays because of the calendar that they use because they they use the lunar cycles to determine things they you know the new moons and things uh it varies just a little bit you know it can be any time during the week but uh, it did end on Saturday. Uh, it recognizes the day that Moses received the Torah, when he received the Ten Commandments in particular, I suppose. Um, this was the third month, verse 1 we just read, the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt. And so that is the important thing that happened in the first month. Uh, you know when you go back to the the passover um that's that's what happened in the first month and particularly on the the 15th day i think we can see in exodus chapter 12 and verse 6 um exodus chapter 12 and verse 6 talks about that 15th day of the month when they were to celebrate fully the Passover. They were to kill the lamb, the Passover lamb. They were to, to, and it was supposed to, you know, its blood being put on the doorpost and on the lentils was to be a sign for the spirit of death or the uh, the angel of death, and it was to pass over them. Uh, and it was on that day that God saved them and pulled them out of Egypt, and. This this next feast day in the third month, um, roughly 50 days after the Passover, they are to celebrate. Uh, they're to celebrate by receiving this this law. Um, I don't know if that's really a celebration or not, but it is. It is what they did uh, the third month after they. Um, they left the the Egyptian slavery uh, roughly 50 days after the Passover. They they received this law. Now, perhaps it's only an interesting parallel. I find it very interesting, um, but perhaps it is meaningful, especially those present on that day in A.D. 30. You know they're they're looking at this feast day as a day to celebrate an an ingathering, uh, a a harvest of sorts, a, a sort of a preliminary harvest, um, the first fruits, the the very first thing that they bring in. You know they've worked some over the spring and now they're starting to to see the benefits, um, but when they get there. They hear this sound like a mighty rushing wind, Acts chapter 2, and they, they see this miraculous thing happen where these people are, these 12 fishermen, these 12 Galileans are preaching in different languages. They're speaking in languages that they understand. And now they're receiving this new law, uh, hence... They ask the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? We, we see that some things have happened that we've done wrong, that we have sins that stand between us and God. What shall we do? Um, you know, there's a new law that is being given. And so I think it's pretty amazing that, I mean, I think it, it shows God's plan that this is what he wanted to do. This is what he wanted people to realize. He wanted them to realize, hey, there is a new law that is being given to us uh, in, 
in this time. Uh, and it's still coming from God, so it's just as important. Let's look at uh, some of the parallels uh, that, that we might see here uh, between the two days, between this day when the Jews received the Ten Commandments, when they saw this, this great and awesome sight of God on the mountain, uh, which I don't think they were supposed to really look at, but it was that awesome, that terrible. And compare it to the great and awesome day of the Lord in Acts chapter 2. Let's look at some parallels here. Uh, first of all, let's read verses 4 through 8 of Exodus chapter 19. There Moses, uh, or God says through, the, through Moses, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the pro of the people to the Lord. So let's look. Let's start by looking at some parallels here. Uh, number one, God had saved His people. That's what verse four is talking about. He had saved His people. Now, how did He do that? We see from the passage that uh, that Moses wrote that he uh, he defeated Pharaoh and his chariots. Uh, and in that way, he bore the Israelites on eagles' wings. You know, so if you go back and look at the, uh, the time when, that he's talking about here, this is one of those times that we've talked about in recent weeks um, that, that show that God works in these times to show that he is the only possibility. You know, they were let go by the Egyptians, and then Pharaoh changed his mind and sent chariots after them, they were goners. For all intents and purposes, they should have been recaptured, or worse, annihilated. But look at everything that God did for them. Number one, he made the, he, he made the ground wet all of a sudden, and the, the, he, the, uh, the chariots started sinking into the ground. And then once all of the Israelites got over on the other side of the Red Sea, he closed those walls onto the Egyptian armies. Only God could have done that. They were recaptured. I mean, they, they should have been recaptured, but they, they weren't. And so he bore them on eagles' wings, and I think the idea there is he bore them quickly uh, across the Red Sea, uh, and you might you might look at all right so the last thing we heard was apparently he bore them quickly across the red sea um he saw the blood of the lamb he passed over them the sacrifice was made they left the place of their slavery so we too have been taken out of a place of slavery. As Paul says to the Colossian Christians uh, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So, He's taken us I mean, He has saved us. He has saved us out of slavery to sin. But there's more that He requires of us. What does He require of us? Well, He, has, he gave the Israelites a condition. Verse 5. He said, Obey my voice. 
and keep my covenant. And this is really the condition that, that God has given us even today. He's given us the condition to keep his commandments. Uh, John chapter 14 and verse 15. John chapter 14 and verse 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And, you know, we could talk about the... Um, we could talk about how John writes it there and that there is, you know, we have to make a decision as to uh, whether or not we think that Jesus says he that we will keep his commandments. It's it's a foregone conclusion that if we love him, it's what we'll, it's what we're going to do, and that makes sense. But it also makes sense that Jesus is saying if we love him, we will keep his commandments. Just like as a parent, we might use that imperative future tense. You will do what I say. Um, and John says that this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Third John chapter, or first John chapter five and verse three. And so when we look at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, we see that uh, God gave a condition there as well. He is conditioning salvation. He is conditioning our our souls salvation on the fact that we do as he commands. He is the source of eternal salvation for them that obey him. Obedience is there for us. God gives us a law. And on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter, just as Moses gave a condition, uh, God gave the condition through Moses. God gave the condition through the Apostle Peter. That when they asked, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we see there that God gave a condition. He gave a condition for them to receive that gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of salvation, the gift of the remission of sins. And with that gift came a result that God would make them a nation, His nation, my own possession, he says, a holy nation. Now, note what God says in Exodus chapter 19. That all of the earth is his. He says, all the earth is mine. But they had a special opportunity to be truly his. Every nation is technically God's. It's under his control. They are his creation. But to be in that place at that time, to be there and receive the law was to make them God's own special nation for that time. They were truly His among all the others who were rebellious. I think that kind of carries over into the day of Pentecost. Because now, we as Christians are God's chosen people. And what is it that Peter said to do? Be saved from this perverse generation. From the rebellious generation. We talked a little bit about that this morning in our sermon. They took Jesus and crucified him by lawless hands. They used lawlessness to crucify Jesus, to crucify the Son of God. They were pushing themselves away. They were becoming rebellious of God, rebellious towards God. And Peter says, save yourself from this perverse generation, this lawless generation. Now as Christians, though, we are the nation of God. 
Peter would write in second in first Peter chapter two, starting in verse one, putting aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay on Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Because we are added to the church... Just like on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verses 41 and 47, that's the, that's the day that mankind received the law in Jerusalem to spread all over the globe. And in that way, we can become God's special people, God's peculiar people, God's own nation. And just like the Israelites, just like the Israelites were God's own people. Now, you might argue that you know, they were chosen and, and they didn't have a choice. We do. But there's still one more interesting parallel to what happens today and what happened in, on the day of Pentecost in A.D. 30. They responded. In verse 8, Moses points out, or yeah, Moses points out that after he gave the the commands, after he said exactly what God told him to say, the people responded, "All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. All the Lord has spoken, we will do. Everything He says, we will do." It's kind of, I mean, this. I mean, just like I said earlier, this is what. Uh, this is what God has required throughout history. This is what the faithful do. Moses, no, sorry, I'm putting Moses on the ark. Noah did all that God had commanded, exactly as he commanded. The Israelites said, we will do this. Everything the Lord commands, we will do. David was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he did what God required of him what he wanted to do what God wanted him to do and we are the same if we want to be a part of God's chosen nation we have to do as he commands we have to put him in that role of king in our lives and that's why God chose this day to show to his people, well, his former people, I suppose, to show to them that things were changing. And if you imagine, if you, I want to take you to uh, Exodus chapter 20 real quick. Let me see if I can find it. No, go back to Exodus chapter 19, and we're going to read in verse, starting in verse 18. Listen to what, how Moses describes it. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, 
Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And then, you know, we could keep going. But listen to that. Listen to those words. Listen to those pictures that, that Moses is talking about here, that he's, he's writing, that, that Moses is seeing, he's witnessing. He's giving his testimony of it. Now, we don't see that. It's hard for us to see. It's hard for us to picture. When we see words like that, we often think about, you know, what hasn't happened, what will happen in the future. Apocalyptic language. I mean, just like we talked about in Acts chapter 2 this morning in our sermon. It might be a little bit more... uh, dangerous sounding, I guess, uh, a little more dramatic. I mean, but it's com- and it's coming from Joel as well. But listen to what Peter says. This is what you're seeing. This is what you're witnessing on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 19, he says, And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. I wonder if what they're seeing or, or what they're hearing is just another way that God is showing the parallel. Uh, to the day that Moses received the law. And we could talk about how the sun went dark on Jesus at, when Jesus died. Uh, there was darkness on the whole earth for three hours, middle of the day, and there was darkness. Um, we could talk about how a lot of times people would, will move this forward uh, to Peter's time, and talk about the destruction of Jerusalem because the the great and awesome day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is often a day of destruction uh, for a nation. And so a lot of people will talk about the destruction of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. But I'm wondering if, if he's pointing out this is, this is what God's showing you. This is what God was showing the people of Israel who were in Jerusalem for the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of the first fruits. He was showing them there's a new law. There's a new way. And if you want to be right with God, this is what you need to do. I encourage you to go back and listen if you, if you hadn't heard it, if you didn't listen to it this morning, the, the sermon. Um, I think there's a lot, lot more information about what the what they were hearing then and and some application to us but this is also applicable because God showed his power for in this way for the last time he gave us the last message the gospel through these these 12 men and then Paul came in later um but they laid their hands on people so that they would receive the the miraculous knowledge and then once their job was done. Once that which was perfect had come, that which was complete, the New Testament, we have it. We had it. We don't need miracles anymore. God has given His law for the last time, and it's the perfect law, the perfect law of liberty. And so He encourages us to turn to Him in this way and be free from our sins. And so we want to encourage you to do that. All right, so we're going to close it out there. Um, Sorry about the technical difficulty earlier. Um, We had a great worship service. We we had a couple more this week than than we did last week, and uh, so we just keep our uh, attendance keeps going up and up and up, and we're thankful for that, and we pray that uh, you're staying healthy. Um, Pray everybody's staying healthy uh, in your homes, and... uh, we would love for you, if you're in the area, to come and visit us. Uh, here's our address. Again, we're just doing Sunday morning worship at 10 a.m. at the building. We are live streaming if you can't make it. Uh, but if you can make it, we want to encourage you to come. Um, 
there on the screen you also have the phone number for the church building give us a call leave a message if you have a question shoot me an email gkcircle2 at gmail.com if you have a question follow us on facebook uh the facebook.com slash palmyra.churchofchrist uh if you want to keep up with us on the social media platform on facebook or we also have our this channel on youtube that you're watching so i encourage you to like and subscribe and ring bells and you know whatever else needs to be done you know find the bell that you need to ring down here somewhere um to make sure you get all the that bell make sure that you get all of the notifications of when we're live and whatnot so um I want to encourage you to do that as well. All right. Let's have a closing prayer, and then we will um, we'll be virtually dismissed. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thanking you for our lives, uh, thanking you for the opportunities we have to serve you and worship you, and we pray your blessings on us as we do so. We're thankful for uh, this way of uh, communicating your word, and we pray uh, you would continue to bless us in this way. Uh, that we may make your word clear uh, to a broad audience and help people to understand their need to follow your law, uh, to put you as king in their lives, and uh, that uh, you're not like, make, help them realize that you're not like other kings, uh, other rulers who will control for their own benefits, but you actually control us for our benefit. Uh, you love us and you want us to return to you and you want us to have uh, lives that uh, are full of love and service, and we pray, Father, your blessings on us as we try to do that. Uh, we ask, Father, that you'll be with all of those who are sick, uh, who are suffering from uh, this virus and from other things as well. Be with those who have lost loved ones, and we pray your blessings on them and comfort them and help us uh, to be an encouragement to those who need that, need that encouragement. Uh, we ask, Father, that you'll uh, be with all those who are serving our nation at this time, uh, who are uh, focusing their attention on this virus and, and trying to keep us safe, and we pray that uh, you'll keep them safe as they do that. Uh, we ask, Father, that you'll be with us as we continue through our lives and help us to serve you in every way that we can. Uh, Father, we're mostly thankful for your Son, who is given us given to us as the sacrifice for our sins, so that we can be free uh, from that slavery, from that dreaded master, and it's in His name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>